Hello and welcome to Muse Jam Session Recording 188. My name is Danny Beaumont. Thanks for joining us today, whether you're joining it live or recorded on the YouTube channel. I'm happy to have you on board. We've not done a jam for a couple weeks, and two weeks from now, I'm going to be at the Adobe Max conference. So uh, let's dig in and make this one count. As many of you know, a couple years back, we delivered scroll effects in Muse. And scroll effects, let me kind of do a little visual tour here for a second. So scroll effects allow you to define the speed with which things happen. So for example, you can have objects that move at a different speed of scroll, so objects that move more slowly when other objects are moving more quickly. You can also control opacity, so objects can appear and disappear as you scroll through a page. Uh, there's also scroll motion, which allows you to use animation tools like Edge Animate and Animate CC, which is the newer version of Edge Animate, formerly known as Flash Pro. But both of those tools allow you to create animations and apply that animation either to autoplay or to move at the speed of scroll. And the last is support for slideshows and animating a slideshow at the speed of scroll. When we introduced responsive design in February of this year, we honestly were a bit overwhelmed with the fact that the visual design tool known as Adobe Muse allowed you to create multiple breakpoints which cause objects to move on the page based on the width of the browser. And it made the idea of defining a scroll effect with a variable width browser um, break, in essence. There wasn't a mental model that we could use without somewhat re-engineering the scroll effects feature in a different way. So we turned off scroll effects for sites that had more than one breakpoint. And uh, more recently, so maybe we did that last fall. Time is running away from me. Um, hard to tell. But uh, I think in the February release, we re-enabled scroll effects on fixed breakpoints. And in this session, I, I want to focus on a couple things. One is really just best practices for responsive design. And the other is to talk about how, you know, what is scroll effects, what is responsive design, how the two come together. But this is, a, this is not necessarily a project session. I kind of want to jump around. And I honestly really want to rely on some feedback from you. So as we're going, I, I need some need, need to get word <laughs> about what you have been finding as you try to combine these techniques if you have experimented with them. In looking at the poll when we got started, at least 80% of you have built four or more websites. So I'm going to assume for a moment you're familiar with both of those features. And I really want to hear from you what you're trying to achieve as you combine them. Uh, we are going to basically jump in, I think, as we tell this story um, using this website. So many of you know that follow what we do, um, that this is a site that I maintain. It's for my son's rowing website here in San Francisco. Um, when all you are is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. No, 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 that's not it. <laughs> Wrong metaphor. When all you are is a hammer, everything does look like a nail, but I didn't mean that one. The other one is plumbers have the worst pipes, which is uh, just the concept that if you're in the world of web design, it seems like uh, your own personal website is the last thing you have time to work on and is always in the worst shape because you're so busy helping your clients. Um, so I had built this site out about two years ago, and I intended to make it a responsive site uh, a year later, so last October, and it took me until about um, a month ago to actually make it happen. And in all honesty, I work on it to help the team find bugs and to learn the tool. So every time I bumped into an issue or a question, I would stop the design and go work with the team for a period of time. And that slowed the progress. But I have finished the design. And uh, I just want to talk about what I implemented and why I implemented it and how both scroll effects and responsive design come together in this example. So 
Let's step back just for a second and define a little bit about responsive design. I'm sorry, scroll effects. My brain will join us very soon, I promise. We're two weeks out from Max. I'm going to put a plug in on Max uh, at the end of this session. If you're coming to the show, uh, let me know because we're going to have lots of wonderful things. Max is Adobe's user conference. It's going to be in San Diego, California, the first week of October. Ali Pordelli from cookie.com will be there. Um, along with many of our other widget and template providers and lots of the Adobe Muse team. So it's going to be a really good time. We have about 15 different sessions that are there, and I'm working with presenters. Um, the good news if you're not attending is after the show, after the event, we do allow you to watch some of these sessions online. So I will make a point of trying to point folks to those sessions, uh, probably on the Facebook, Twitter pages. But with Max aside and excuses aside for my brain being a bit scattered, here on this side, we, we did a demo asset a few years back called the Wild Isles. And when we first introduced scroll effects, we built out this individual page, the gear guide, to explicitly show off each of the scroll effect effects. So what you'll notice is as I scroll down, this is, to be clear, this is not a responsive design. This is uh, an alternate website. There is a phone version here, and if I click on the preview, this was sort of a lazy way to bring up the phone layout. You'll notice it's that phone alternate layout, but it's not a responsive design, which is why I was able to implement all of the scroll effects. And it is a place to really show off those different effects in place. So the first scroll effect that you'll notice is the navigation on the top of the page here is pinned. It is not moving. Now, many of you know in Muse, you can come in and pin an object to the top of the browser uh, using the pinning interface. That is terrific, but it doesn't work on touch-enabled devices like tablets and smartphones. So being able to pin in a way that consistently works across those classes of devices is important. And setting an object to basically not scroll at all, so with zero scroll applied, is one technique that folks use to get that consistent header um, to pin or be persistent across all of the different types of devices. So that first bit is a pinned navigation using scroll effects. The next thing you'll notice is we've got some words here, gear you need. And as I scroll up, um, you'll notice that there is text that's appearing here. And the way that is applied is with a scroll effect that basically allows you to, um, it's an opacity feature. So as you scroll up, the other object in essence is becoming visible as I come along here. Notice as I continue, that next object is disappearing. So I have the ability to have it appear a little bit higher and then to wipe away. So fill your pack starts to disappear. Another thing starts to happen is there is an animation that is right around here. It was built in Edge Animate, and it's a bird that is basically animated on a path. And as I drag up, as I scroll down on the page in essence, the bird is first off becoming uh, visible. So as you might guess, the bird's kind of sitting right here. That animation is here on the canvas, but the opacity is set to none. So as I scroll up, I'm first using a scroll effect to control the visibility of that animation. Once I've done that, notice that as I continue to scroll, the bird is basically flying on a path that the path, basically the flying, um, is happening at the speed of scroll. As such, if I drag back down, it's always hard to show scroll effects when you can't see my hands. This hand? Yeah. Um, as I go backwards in the page or scroll backwards, the bird is going backwards on that path. So it is moving at the speed of scroll or animating at that speed of scroll. Other little crazy disco things that are going on is notice that we have callouts here. Those call callouts are set to zero opacity and they are becoming visible as I proceed down the page. Notice we're, always we're also using that opacity swipe here as I move down on the page. It appears as though the color of the backpack is changing. These are honestly different images with that opacity transition happening there. It's a little disco this site, so 
I always say that our demo sites are kind of like a ransom note. We shove every feature into one site, <laughs> whether or not it should have it. But as I proceed down the way here, notice that I have a scroll effect applied to the spoons and they're moving down as I'm scrolling up. And beautifully, they're not only moving down, but I'm going back and forth. Um, as I scroll down, they're layered behind another image. So I have one image here, then I have these images that have scroll effects applied, and I have uh, an additional image behind that. So it gives the impression of it dropping into the backpack, and that's really just the scroll effect applied to those spoons. Um, lastly, you'll notice the sleeping bag is kind of swiping up. And to show another animation effect, I've got the ant that's happening here now. Now my hands, see, no hands, nothing moving. Um, video is really great sometimes when your hair is in a better place. But uh, that animation is set to play at a certain position. So although um, I've taken my hands off the keyboard, the animation is continuing. I tried to get the ant to go into the sleeping bag, but it was too hard at the time. Um, but this is an example of, unlike the bird, the bird moves at the speed of scroll. The ant is actually triggering or starting its animation at a certain point in the design. And then it's auto-playing. So that ant will continue um, for quite some time. I think perhaps we fade it out or it crawls into the sleeping bag, one of the two. Could stay forever. And as we get down towards the bottom of the page, what I have here is a slideshow. And if I extend, there's that ant. It's going to plague us. Um, but the way the slideshow manifests itself is we took a video and we opened it up in Photoshop and we saved out frames from the video. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of still frame or stop frame animation. Um, it is a full video, but we grab some frames and as I progress down the page, it's as though the video is playing in the browser to show those steps. And I achieve that by way of a slideshow. So depending on what you're looking to do, depending on your skill level, if you're familiar with tools like Edge Animate or Animate CC, um, the extent to which you'll build out anim animations and add them into Muse um, is kind of varied. So that's one sort of just primer for us all to remember exactly how scroll effects work. Um, there's another one, um, uh, one of our customers out in the community, um, Aaron Lawrence, put together uh, a Mac session for me a couple years back. And after that session, I really wanted to leverage what he taught. And uh, we basically published this scroll effects site as a tutorial to teach different scroll effects in action. And there's kind of an Easter egg on this site. If you roll over the triangle, it allows you to download the source files for what I'm about to show you. So as I proceed down on the page, we have basically different scroll effects. And interestingly enough, they're all sort of variations of one another, but it's amazing to me when folks like Prince Ali or Aaron Lawrence are given a tool like Muse, the creative ways that they implement solutions. So um, for example, if I click in here, uh, Aaron, is simulating this idea of speed as an object flies through the, through the page, in essence, this airplane. And what Aaron did, which can be a little mentally confusing, is the graphic that he's using here. It's simulating what's known as the T-handle in scroll effects. And he's also showing you the settings that you would need to apply to create that same effect in uh, an asset of your own. But notice as I scroll down on the page, this airplane is going to get to a certain position. So it's moving at the speed, that I would say something like, well, we, we know the answer, right? Um, initially, this plane is moving at one times the speed of scroll in a, an up and right direction. So it's as though it's moving across the canvas at an angle, and it's moving at the speed of scroll. So one equals actual speed of scroll. If I apply a scroll effect to an object and set it as one in the downward direction, you'll see no scroll effect because it's basically um, matching the normal speed of scroll for all the other objects on the page, if that makes sense. Quite often you'll see background images are set at 0.8 times the speed of scroll. That gives you um, a depth effect known as parallax scrolling. So just an aside about that, because you'll hear the phrase used, 
parallax scrolling was kind of invented back in the days of 2D gaming. And when you wanted to simulate depth on a page, one way you could do that is objects that were closer to your eye would be fuzzier. Um, objects that were further might be in clearer view. Um, objects that are also further tend to uh, move more slowly. So it simulates that depth. When you have an image set at 0.8 times the speed of scroll, it seems to be a background image. And we'll look at that a little later in this session. But notice as I get to basically where this T handle hits the top of the page, and if I were in Adobe Muse, I could see that the T handle, if I looked at the ruler on the side, would hit at about 890 pixels. So as soon as I hit that point just there, what happens is the plane shoots off the canvas because it's going to move at 30 times the speed of scroll as I scroll up. So I encourage you to go ahead and come to this site. It's scrolleffects.com. And just experiment with each of the design elements. You can download that source file and try it out yourself. Um, some of them are just really lovely. So we have, for example, this layering effect. And that is achieved by basically setting the speed of scroll for each of this fish uh, to be different. So some are moving more quickly than others in those setting attributes. Some other really fun ones around typography. So if I look here and see ready, set, go, notice the T handles in their location. As I get to a certain point, boom, I hit a T handle and the word ready starts to fly away in essence, right? It gives you that fly away effect. When I hit the second T handle, set falls apart and go falls apart. If I come back down on the page, and once again, Aaron's giving you the attributes he's using, inversely instead of flying apart you can magically bring objects to fly together by inverting those same scroll effects and it goes on and on i mentioned aaron's just such a brilliant creative guy and he really has some terrific examples here okay scroll effects kind of went wild in the world probably three years ago and i don't know if you're with me but um sometimes things are fun for a while and then they become really annoying in that uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I believe, in, in my opinion, that the tasteful implementation of scroll effects can be incredibly powerful if they add to the work and add the, to the design that you're doing. I did a quick check um, out there in the world because since scroll effects have happened, and responsive design had happened, I kind of wanted to see what I could find out there in nature. So non-Muse built sites that touted that they were applying scroll effects to see how many of them also had responsive design applied to it. So when you take uh, this poor site, for example, what you'll notice is they're using kind of that backpack approach where it seems as though you're swiping to another image um, by using that opacity feature now, there is a trick to that, and let's see if we have time to do it, but the way, that it, <laughs> the way that this works is if you actually fill a container, we'll try to dig up this file if I have a chance, and you guys shout out that you really want to see it, but the way it tends to work in Adobe Muse is that you create a container, a rectangle, and then you fill the container with an image and set the scroll effect on that fill object. That's how it seems as though you're replacing one image with another. But this is absolutely something that can be done with Adobe Muse. And as you sort of start to dissect what's more sophisticated out there in the world, notice that this is a responsive design. And it's got things like the header content is staying pinned to the top of the page. This text container here, notice as I drag the edge of the browser, it's going to different breakpoints. So here's... Um, Here's a fluid breakpoint or a fluid text container in a fluid breakpoint. And when I get to a certain breakpoint, usually in the world of Muse, when your design breaks, so notice that it's getting rather crowded over that car, I press and drag and jump to a different breakpoint where I can optimize my content for that next class of devices. So that standard breakpoint methodology with Adobe Muse there is a caveat to the way that Muse works, which is if you want to combine scroll effects and responsive design, the one rule is that you need to make sure that the breakpoint that you're applying the scroll effects on 
is a fixed breakpoint and not fluid. I have grown to be pretty comfortable with that myself because one thing many of us probably realize by now, if you apply a lot of scroll effects to content and that content is being loaded on a tablet or a smartphone, it can be a nightmare for the user. I don't know that scroll effects that are in heavy use in these smaller footprints, smaller layouts, really need to have such heavy features as scroll effects applied all over the place. So there is a way that you can choose to have scroll effects applied to pretty much every breakpoint out there, um, save for probably the smallest breakpoint if that's your smartphone device. Um, the question is whether or not you really want to do it and if it's critical to your workflow. So uh, that's one example. Let's look at another one here. Um, again, this was just a quick cursory look. Uh, what I find is in the world of responsive design, um, this world of flat design and card-based design um, really, I think, is a reflection of trends from a design standpoint, but also a reflection of technology. When you build out a responsive site, it is very, very hard when you have multiple breakpoints to take every object and define its responsive behavior if it's a complex, complex page. So a lot of visual designers that know they're building out a responsive website, I believe really simplify, unify that site an awful lot. When you're introducing scroll effects on top of that, it's yet another level of complexity you have to think through. If you look at this site, there's some interesting scroll effects that are applied. So let's kind of dissect it. I've got a header area here. I've got some rollover effects. Um, I can choose a language as well. Notice as I press and drag here, they probably, in essence, if I were doing this in Muse, which this is not a Muse site, um, I would have a background fill image here towards the top. And I might have a container that's set to scale to fill. And as I come down, I'm not really hitting, there we go, I've hit the first probably major break point in the design. And as I continue to scroll, notice that they do have different effects applied. So Muse Native would not have the ability to achieve this particular effect. Notice that there's an image effect that's being applied there. There are definitely third-party widgets from some of the widget providers that allow you to come in and set certain image effects as you scroll, for example. If we come out to the larger version of the page, notice, again, this is really subtle, but it's, I think it's really worth pointing out. Notice here in the largest breakpoint, um, as I scroll down, I'm getting different scroll effects. It's very subtle, but notice that this red container is moving faster than the image just above it. See how the breadsticks or whatever those are might be, yeah, we'll stick with breadsticks because I'm tired and I can't remember the name of the cookie that that is. Uh, yeah, so as I scroll along here, notice that it's moving at a different speed of scroll. The background image, I believe, looks like the image in this example is not, this, there is no scroll effects applied here. All right, I remembered it's called biscotti, sorry. Somebody probably answered that for me. In the container here, notice that this image the red container is not, does not have a scroll effect applied to it, but the image that is filling it does so that as I scroll up and down, I can see more or less of that image. And it creates a nice little feeling of fluidity as I scroll down on the page. But notice here, as I come down to more of a tablet class of devices, eh, there you go. Looks like we still have scroll effects applied. So this is... Uh, and I've just jumped to another breakpoint. So let me just see. If I jump here, yeah, there's continuing to do it. So um, as I jump to different breakpoints, they're continuing to apply the subtle scroll effect. So I think the first thing I'm asking you to do is in your mind, start to decipher what you see on the web. Um, and then we'll start to break down a little bit more of how you achieve it in Adobe Muse. Take one more look at a real world site. This one I grabbed because it's honestly an example of just too much. I, I'm not really sure why you need this many scroll effects. You've got a web page with a web page inside of it, 
and the web page inside of it has a scroll effects applied. You have Z order layering here. Um, I'm not really sure what they're marketing. It looks like it's a hotel and why you need to have <laughs> all this movement. Um, notice as I come to smaller breakpoints, it's still applying the scroll effect. Let's see if it goes all the way down to a phone. So when I get to, yeah, it kind of breaks when it gets to a phone. So I don't know that they have this optimized for mobile devices specifically. Looks like this would not be the phone layout um, for this site. It perhaps uses alternate layouts. That's a good point, which is as you're working, you are welcome to decide that you want to use alternate layouts and scroll effects and responsive design together. So you could do a phone layout that was specifically one whole unique set of content and then let's say tablet smart or tablet to desktop could be a combination of scroll effects and uh, breakpoints. All right, I fear I've just confused the heck out of you guys with too much technology. So let's try to break it down a little bit more. When I was working on this particular site, there, uh, I am not a designer. I never act like I am one. I fake it pretty reasonably well sometimes, though that's bugging me right there. Um, let me see if I can get here. All right, so I used this design as an example in redesigning the Muse website. And there were some interesting just features about the design that I thought lent itself to combining responsive and scroll effects in a way that honestly Muse could achieve. So this is the real site. It is not built in Muse. It is built out by hand coders. Um, but let's just dissect a little bit of the uh, approach that's taken here. So in the desktop design, I've got full navigation. I'm going to stop and glance at chat, make sure you guys are good. I think Prince Ali's taken all the heavy lifting for me. Okay. Thanks, Ali. I owe you. Um, notice in this site, in the desktop design, its largest form, I can roll over uh, different navigation elements. So uh, this is, if you look at this design in the largest breakpoint, um, it has scroll effects applied to it. It has some different techniques. So if I were in Adobe Muse, I could use a trigger target or a composition widget to achieve this kind of rollover behavior. It probably would not be a trigger. I could do full width, but I think that's a little over the top to have the target here go fully white. I have a rollover behavior where as I roll over each container, I get this nice, trans this nice uh, transition to show the emphasis there. And notice you can't really tell because my monitor is only so large, but if I come in and say view, zoom out, kind of trying to simulate as though I want a larger monitor, uh, maybe I can't quite simulate it, but there's a white padding here. No matter how large my browser is, um, that padding is gonna remain. I'll show you the approach that I took to this design. Um, but as I continue down on the page, a couple interesting things happen. So my larger navigation, which is kind of not pinned in any way, as I roll up, it kind of moves into a pinned version. I cannot do this natively in Muse. There are third-party widgets that I've seen that do this, but I can come pretty close to it depending on how complex your site want, you want your site to be. I could fade or transition. Um, so just to explain this out, if you really wanted to achieve this and you're on the largest breakpoint, and this is a fixed breakpoint, you can have this navigation that I'm looking at with um, scroll effects opacity defined go from 100% opacity to zero. And at the same time, I could have a second level navigation that goes from zero to 100%. So that as I scroll down, one navigation goes away and the other one reappears. So this one animates. Um, we would not do that, but you could fade from one to another. And then using scroll effects, have a pinned navigation in this area. Now, as I continue down, notice what they've applied here. So I've, they've got um, a container and inside the container is an image and it's set to 0.8 times the speed of scroll. In their instance, this is actually a slideshow, so I can navigate between these guys. 
we'll talk a little bit about slideshows and composition widgets and uh, responsive behavior in just a little while. But as I proceed through here, notice that for the most part, everything's pretty standard. I've got rollover effects here. So if I roll over an image, I probably wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't have this particular transition using native Muse, but I could easily fade from one image to another. So that's not really a scroll effects, it's more of an animation technique. And as I continue down on the page, I can see that content. Now let's come on up and bring the browser edge down a little bit more. What you'll notice is there's a tablet navigation that's here, and it's an accordion structure, so it has the ability to, uh, to expand and contract. And if I come even smaller, I get to a slightly different header area. Notice I've got this contact area. Jump over to the phone, and I have um, pretty much a different navigation that's optimized for the phone. So if I go to the site that I built, trying to emulate that behavior, let me tell you how close I did get to it. If I come to the top of the page here, what I did is I set my largest breakpoint in Muse to be fixed. It's not a fluid breakpoint, but it's a fixed breakpoint. So um, I think it's about 1400 pixels. And, I, uh, and I'll show you this in Muse, I promise. Um, I went in and defined it such that I do not want my page content to go any wider than 1400. Personally, I think that if you load this up on a 52 inch monitor, and again, let me simulate as though I'm zooming out, I don't want to see this whole content span a huge monitor. I want it to stop at about 1400 pixels. So I set it up to do that with my fixed breakpoint. If I go back now to actual size, and if I press and drag just a little bit, I think I only did 25 pixels or so, I'll go from a fixed breakpoint to a fluid breakpoint. So right about when I hit the edges of these guys, I jump to a fluid breakpoint for tablet. So in this example for this site, I made the decision that I didn't want to have scroll effects on anything other than the largest breakpoint, which is geared towards desktop sites. So now as I proceed down on the page, there is no a scroll effect, a scroll effect, a scroll effect. <laughs> there is no scroll effect applied. As I go back to the larger breakpoint, notice that I have it in this header content here. I have one little trigger target. Notice that these background images have a simple scroll effect applied to it. So just to give that simple animation effect to the page content. For the navigation, I've got trigger target navigation elements and once again, in the largest breakpoint, the header has a scroll effect applied. Pretty much nothing else on the page does. Um, specifically because I maintain this site, I break and fix it at least 10 times a week. And the more complexity, the more chance of breaking that design as you work, um, the less that it's worth it. So I really only applied the scroll effect to that largest breakpoint. Okay. Now that I've slightly proved the integration, I'm going to check on chat real quick. Hmm. Yes, I know. The hard part, you guys, is we could probably spend eight hours discussing all this. It's hard to not be obscure when I'm covering way too many topics. So let's slow it down and break it down for a moment. I'm going to come into Muse. And we, um, since it's fresh in our mind, let's take a look at how I built out the PRC website. So I'm going to come into the master page, and I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Um, notice I've got a number of breakpoints. If I zoom up a little bit more, I'm going to just use keyboard commands. Shift command six takes me to the largest breakpoint. Shift command five or shift control five if you're on a PC will take you to the next smallest. I really like those keyboard commands when you're trying to work with content that occurs across multiple breakpoints. It makes selecting that content really go well. So Shift Command 6 um, brings me to that largest breakpoint. Notice I've got the top navigation. When I set up my page, it doesn't relate to the master. Um, notice there's no arrows here, but on the individual pages, I'm going to show you how I set that to not be infinite width but to be fixed at the largest breakpoint, which is about, looks like we're at about uh, 1,400, maybe slightly less. 
In that largest breakpoint, what I did is just set up a series of trigger targets or composition widgets. So if I show in the light box here, you'll see that's where my desktop navigation occurs. If I jump to the next smallest breakpoint, so let me come on in on this a little bit more just to really bring this home. As many of you know, there's an indicator for a fluid breakpoint, and that is this little arrow to the left and right. I'm trying to get big enough to show you the icon for the other. There we go. So notice the 1400 pixel breakpoint is set to be fixed. It is not a fluid breakpoint, it's a fixed breakpoint. I can also double check by clicking the actual breakpoint area, uh, right clicking on it and bringing up the drop down menu. Notice that fluid width is not checked on that breakpoint, whereas it is checked here. So I put all of my scroll effects at this largest breakpoint, and then I went about 50 pixels. So I think the smallest distance between two breakpoints is about 25, maybe 50. Muse will holler at you if you try to bring them any closer uh, than that, that limit. But I took the next smallest instance and went ahead and made that my fluid breakpoint that would not have scroll effects applied. So that's how I set up the navigation. Um, what I also did in that navigation is you'll notice that in my largest breakpoint, I have some content that's here, but if I click on it, it's pinned to the top of the page using classic pinning. So not using a scroll effect, um, but just using browser-based pinning. Because my assumption is this is loaded on a desktop device. I don't have to worry about iOS devices. If we jump to the next breakpoint in, I went ahead and assumed this would be a tablet class of devices. I did a simple composition trigger target. And inside of that, I, to be honest, um, responsive design widgets, Muse, and the fact that, as I mentioned, I maintain this site a couple times a week, um, precluded my using accordions inside an accordion. So I have what's known as a trigger target. This is an accordion with a single pain in essence. So I have just one drop down and the accordion is set to not overlap the content below it and to close all of the accordion fields so that it will expand and contract appropriately. The magic, the reason why I just use an accordion and inside the accordion I just use simple text containers is I can come to each of these elements. So this text container here Notice that it is set to responsive width. Um, the header area is responsive width. The accordion is not set to responsive width. So it is pretty much a fixed width object, I think. Hold on a second. I'm going to look. Yeah, this is the odd slash magic about uh, Muse right now. When you play with accordions, notice what I did there. I want to explain this for a second. So I have an accordion, right? I have nothing selected right now on the canvas, but if I click once, I'm selecting the accordion. Notice in clicking once, what I've done is I've set it to be left aligned, so it's pinned to the top left of the browser, and it is set to be responsive width. See how that is checked right there? Now how I got to that state is a little magical. So you have to keep clicking and messing around a little bit, to be honest. So if I come to this object and I expand it, and I, let's just try this again. I'm going to hit escape. Notice that for whatever reason, with this accordion selected, I can come in and define its resize right there. Okay? So it's tricky to get to that place. I'm going to show you it one more time. If I click off here, and then I'm going to show you why this is important. If I click off here and click the accordion once, it's going to be funny to me. Notice how I can set it to be responsive in its width. Oh, no. See, it's not that funny. It shows me that it's set to be responsive width, but as a designer, you say, okay, great. How did you do that, Danny? It looks like it's grayed out. If I click again to open it up, nothing happens, right? It's locked. Hit escape. You can now come in and set the value. So in my opinion, just keep fiddling with it. Hit escape and click in until you get to where you can define it. The reason why this is kind of extra magical is if I go to something like Safari and I go to the site, I'm going to use Safari because I can show multiple layouts. 
So I'm going to go into sort of developer mode for Safari. And I'm going to show you these different navigation choices. So I can jump to something like an iPad Pro in size, play around a little bit here, but I can start to see how the behavior works. And if I drop down this menu that I've created, that I've just shown you, notice what happens. It was a little rough there, but notice that as I'm reducing the width of my tablet device, the accordion is actually scaling. It's percentage based, based on the width of the device. So if I go a little bit larger, it's going to grow to that certain percentage. I'd say it's about 60% of the overall width until I jump down to the phone layout. And when I get to the phone layout, actually, let's come here. The phone layout, it's a different menu. It's a single menu, single across, and it's set to be full width of the page so that I get this just nice consistent behavior on smartphones. If I jump out to tablets, I've got two across, but it's fluid in essence. It scales based on the width of the device. All right, that's a bit about the navigation. If we go back though to the world of breakpoints versus scroll effects, the largest breakpoint is fixed and it allows me to apply the scroll effects. What I had to do though is make sure my master has that largest breakpoint set to be fixed and not responsive. I'm going to uh, hide this out so it doesn't ruin anything else we're going to look at and I'm going to jump out to an individual page. So if I now come into let's say team news here. Now again this is a pretty complicated site. It's got a lot of content so um, the cleaner your design is um, the more testing you do for things like navigation, once you lock that in, it's a site that can pretty easily be updated from time to time. This needs to move down. Uh, but notice how I've gone in and approached it at this point. So if I go down to the tablet breakpoint, this tablet is set to be a fluid breakpoint. There is no responsive design on here at all. I'm sorry, there is no scroll effects. So all these objects, if I try to apply a scroll effect, in this current breakpoint and opened up scroll effects, it's going to let me know that the breakpoint I'm on is set to be fluid and we do not allow that. Let me explain why we don't allow that. If I go to the next breakpoint up uh, where I have an object, let's say it's this background fill, notice I have a scroll effect that's applied here and that scroll effect is reliant on its location and relationship to the browser. So here's a fill container. I've said, do me a favor, have that background move at 0.9 times the speed of scroll. So a very subtle scroll effect as you scroll down on the page to that fill image. When we built out the Muse experience, it's the only tool I know of that allows you to visually design scroll effects. We said, let's use the top of browser, the T handle as it's known. Let's use top of browser to indicate when an object becomes visible or when an object begins to animate or move across the page. Um, if you take objects, let's say I move down on the page and I wanted to apply a scroll effect here. The truth is if it's a fluid breakpoint, there's not an absolute distance for us from an engineering standpoint from the top of browser to that object for us to enable a scroll effect. I hope that makes sense, but I, the metaphor we're using is T handles define top of browser for its behavior. When engineering has the time, I think they have a mental model for how they can make scroll effects work with fluid breakpoints. And that would be more related to when this object is, let's say, this distance from not the top of browser, but perhaps the object just above it. Um, we could do it in relationship to other elements on the page. But for now, uh, we are just enabling it in fixed breakpoints. Having said that, as you work on your design, you can absolutely apply scroll effects to your entire site. So everything from your larger breakpoint down to some of your smaller breakpoints. I would say the exception to that and what I hear hand coders do is they will apply scroll effects on breakpoints 
for everything from desktop to smartphone, and they may do 20 breakpoints because they're doing fixed breakpoints. They're not doing fluid breakpoints. This is what I've heard as best practices for hand coders. The only exception for them is the smallest breakpoint, the smartphone breakpoint, they make that one fluid because uh, with the smartphones, you've got a wide variety of sizes and you want to make sure everything works and allow viewport scaling to scale to the width of that smartphone. Okay, I feel like I'm talking to myself and I'm talking about too many complex ideas. So let's try to slow it down a little bit more. I'm going to go to my good old Pigeon website. So I have one page from the Pigeon site. I realize that this site is about a year old and I've come a long way as, lo as well as Muse has come a long way since that time. And uh, there's just been a lot of learnings that have taken place and a lot of robustness to the tool. I kind of feel a need to redesign this site. But what you'll notice is the site as it exists. Um, let's just see what we got here. This is the tricky part of breakpoints. You got to get to a spot that's big enough. So this is a fixed width. Let me try this. I'm going to revert the site. And of course, we're low on time again. I'm going to double click. All right, so here's the default state of the site. It is a fluid breakpoint site. It's got a breakpoint at 1,200, 900, and 480. So if I wanted to introduce scroll effects on this site, what I would do personally is I would come on in and I would add another breakpoint slightly larger than the one I have right now. So I'm going to just press and drag my breakpoint bar uh, just somewhere for now. And then I'm going to click the plus sign to create a new breakpoint. And then I'm going to try to zoom in again here so I can get to that breakpoint because I set a pretty small one. And I'm going to right click and go to breakpoint properties. I can come in here and set the distance. So if this is 1200, I'm going to set my larger one to about 1250. Give myself a little bit of room. And then I'm going to also come in and set this to be a fixed width breakpoint. And I'll click OK. When I zoom out a little bit now, I have basically that fixed width breakpoint that we've defined. Nothing else on the page has changed very much. If I go back to the one just inside of that, the 1200 pixel breakpoint, let's say I wanted to fade these images in as you scroll down on the page. If I click to select it, when you go to the scroll effects, it's going to tell me I can't do that because I'm looking at a fluid width breakpoint. If instead I jump out to the wider breakpoint, select that object, scroll effects are enabled. So really that simple. You need to, in your design, think it through, but make sure that any of the layouts that you want to have a scroll effect are fixed in size. I can come in and basically define opacity here. So I can select that all three of these images go from zero to 85%. Um, obviously, I've done this before at about 565 pixels. So if I come in and select one object here, it's tough for me to show you this zooming because it doesn't really work over the tool, the screen sharing tool I'm using. But here's my object. There is a T handle. That is when in the browser scroll effects begins. There's something setting opacity. So it begins at 0% opacity, gets to the T handle, jumps to 85%, and then in theory will fade back away again. So let's just kind of see that in action. If I come on in and preview the page, patiently. And we start at that largest breakpoint. And let's just focus on those images. So as I come up on the page, nothing happens, no. Uh, I get to that point where I'm at that 580 something pixel point and the images are fading in. So here they are fading in and pretty darn quickly they fade back out again. And all three have that same fade effect applied. I could come in and stretch it out and have it not disappear. I can have it continue in that way. 
um, other little bits that you might want to play with is I do want the navigation here to be uh, to be pinned so I can come into these objects and select them let's see if I go back to my master page and I select the pigeon and the text and the button here uh, I can I use scroll effects to apply that now it's saying that's interesting I'm gonna do the same thing here it's pretty much important to make sure that whatever fixed breakpoints you have on pages match the ones that you have on your master page so let's go in and add one there I'm gonna rough it out too large here so I can come in and grab it and go in and set that to 1250 we're gonna tell that to be a fixed width breakpoint and click OK I can now come in and suggest that all of these objects here be pinned or set to no scroll scroll effect so I'm going to go back to motion and I'm going to check it I'm going to make sure that this is just set to zero all the way across the board so at the top of the site go ahead and set it to no scroll effects so it's now in essence pinned if I come back to my main site I've got a rectangle here and it's a bit of a long story but uh, if I jump to the main page what you'll notice is I've got images that are on, I've got white that's on a background image. That orange rectangle exists on the master page so that I could see where my navigation was. To be honest, it's also important in the finished design, and let me show you why. So if I come on in and preview this page now, I have a master with what I expect the header content to be pinned, and I also have those images with their opacity set. So as I come along here, what happens is, see how I get a bit of a clash for my navigation? My navigation staying up here. I have this nice orange background, and you can't really see it because the rectangle's in its way, but it's okay up at the top because there's no conflict. But pretty soon as I get close to the word pigeon, there starts to be a tacky clash. So in order to overcome the tacky clash, what I can do is say to this header content, I'm going to select it that I want it to have a scroll effect to apply to it. You just think for a minute. I want it to be opacity. So I want it to fade from zero, so invisible, to 100% at about, I think I want this to not be, I'm not sure why these are negative values. Let's try, all right, let's let it be for now. So what I'm doing is having this rectangle appear or fade in just around the time that the white letters are going to clash with each other. So let me jump back out, come on into the page, see if I got away with that. So I'm going to preview it in the browser and see where we are. I'm going to stop and take questions just after I show this. All right. We might be in good shape, let's see. So notice I can see the full image here, and I've got my lovely navigation, and as I scroll down on the page, it is not scrolling. Um, the navigation's staying fixed, but just, if I'm lucky, just about the time, no, it's not doing it. Um, I would probably need to fiddle a little bit. I don't wanna tear up too much time. Let me try real quick, because I hate when I can't show something. So let's try this object again. What I think I want to do is have it be at about 150. So let's set this to um, zero. And then at 150 pixels, I want it to appear. And at uh, 200 pixels, I want it to stay. So I pretty much want that scroll effect to continue. I could set this to 150 as well, just to explain the fact that it goes from zero to 100% and then it sticks around. If I did that right, let's go on in and see. All right, fingers crossed. As usual with scroll effects, experimentation is your friend. So as I come in on the page here, if I'm lucky, I know, I'm not gonna have it happen. 
That's okay. I know you guys believe me. Um, the intention would be to have that rectangle fade in and be visible up here at the top. Oh, alas, but we don't have much time. So what I want to do is kind of stop this a little bit. This is a heady topic and I need some feedback, which is, does this make sense to you? <laughs> Are we, uh, is the feature robust enough for you? I think that in theory, we all wanted responsive design and then in practice, having multiple breakpoints for every object on a page became overwhelming. In theory, we want things like composition widgets to be fully responsive until you start thinking about the fact that you can nest widgets inside of widgets and the responsive behavior of all those objects starts to become overwhelming. I think that um, teaching this can be tough this is going to be an area of focus for me in the next few months. So we're scurrying off to Max. I do want to mention that one more time. Uh, for In about two weeks, I will be there at the show in San Diego. And when we're back uh, for the holidays, we're going to kind of refresh jam sessions, take a look at how we can be more impactful. I'm going to come up with a sequence of features that we should show off. As usual, we usually launch new features at Max. So Stay tuned for some new Muse capabilities. And um, I would love, you're welcome to send me an email, Danny at Adobe, but feedback about how to understand this feature better, what kind of visual examples would help you to implement it, and um, just how to take it further. So I'm going to stop chatting now because we're at that point. I'm going to put up a poll. I'm a little afraid for this one, but feedback from you if this helped you, if it confused you, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but uh, your thoughts about whether or not we covered the topic. Don't be mean. I've had a hard day. <laughs> um, and in the chat, please throw in either ideas for making it better or send me an email. Um, also, other jam sessions that you'd like to see covered as we move forward. I have spent um, about three weeks straight working on that rowing website from scratch and also another demo asset that I'll be using at Max. It has helped me immensely in understanding responsive design and how to teach it, how to work with it more. Um, look for some really nice tutorials coming out pretty soon that really break down the idea of pinning objects, fluid objects, and multiple breakpoints. So if you don't stop me, that is what the next jam sessions will continue to be about, really taking specific projects and building them out. So as usual, thank you for giving me another hour of your life. And uh, stay tuned for after max probably four weeks from now would be likely uh, our next jam section and uh, what that topic will be will be what's new with muse that one's pretty much guaranteed in fact as such i will uh, commit to a jam session three weeks from now and four weeks from now because we'll have announced new capabilities at muse and i want to come home and uh, let everybody else know so we'll see you in three weeks uh, and thank you so much for your time